Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, the friends, wherever you are based on that like a timing zone. And uh, I'm Arke Singh. I'm the moderator of this webinar, which is info enhancing rice production in salt affected areas through effective salinity and water management studies. And it is jointly organized by ICBA and Malaysian Agriculture Research and Development Institute, Mar Mardi. You can see the name of this webinar. It's very important because rice is the staple food for about half, half of the world population. Though rice is very sensitive to salinity, but it's still there is no way that particularly in the tropical coastal area, the rice is the predominant crop, and it is because of the, it's a, like a, it's arid climate status, because no other crop food crop can stay under the waterlogged conditions. So it is next because when we talk about the salinity, it is next to the drought. It is the biggest one of the biggest abiotic stress, and that way it is very very important topic. Today we have like a four for uh, uh, speaking like four uh, four uh, um, speakers, and these four speakers will be speaking on the different aspect. I will just come one by one on that one. And before that, I would like to just invite because we have the two distinguished guests from Dr. Uh, Dr. Charbel Taraf from uh, ICWA. He is a chief uh, operation and development, and also. Dr. Dr. Mohammad Sayafuddin Abdul Rahman, Director of Rice Paddy Research Station, Mardi. So they will be welcoming us. First, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Sharwal Tra for the welcome remarks. Dr. Sharwal Tra, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. RK. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you for organizing this very important uh, webinar. Uh, and good day for, for uh, everyone, wherever you are. So, esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar today as we discuss a topic that, as Dr. R.K. mentioned, uh, many of us share an interest in. Food security has many dimensions and aspects, but is, for different reasons, underpinned by a few staple crops, and rice is one of them. Indeed, the crop is one of the cornerstones of food security worldwide. Rice is, a, is the food staple for over half the world's population, as Dr. R.K. mentioned. It provides up to 50% of the dietary caloric intake for millions living in poverty in Asia and is therefore critical for food security. It's also becoming an important food staple in both Latin America and Africa. But its productivity is being increasingly constrained by a number of factors, including climate change and salinity. In fact, salt-related stress is the second biggest factor limiting rice's productivity, affecting more than 1.2 billion hectares of arable and land globally. And this stress is expected to rise due to climate change impact and inappropriate water management. So it's important to develop salt tolerant rice varieties and introduce sustainable irrigation practices to enhance rice production, especially in salt affected areas. We need new varieties with higher yield potential and stability across environments, climates, and geographic locations. We also need to sustainably use water resources to prevent and control salinization. Currently, research studies are being conducted in various countries to breed salt tolerant rice varieties and promote sustainable water management practices. Since 2020, our center has also conducted a series of experiments to determine the most suitable method for irrigating salt tolerant rice varieties and identify the best performing ones under saline and desert conditions of the UAE. The objective is to develop effective approaches to cultivating salt tolerant rice varieties in local conditions as well as in other countries with similar conditions. This work has been possible thanks to collaboration, particularly with the Bangladesh 
Rice Research Institute. Building on this experience, we look forward to carrying out a joint initiative with other research organizations as well. We believe it's important to combine resources and learn from the best practices to achieve better results. This webinar is an example of such collaboration. Its purpose is to share evidence-based perspectives and experiences in developing salt-tolerant rice varieties and identifying appropriate irrigation methods for rice production. So it's great to have researchers from ICBA and Mardi present the results of their scientific work in this field. I hope this will serve as a starting point for more co co cooperation, sorry, between our institutions. So I look forward for the, such cooperation and to learn more from the experts in the field today. And thank you very much for your attention and best of luck in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jarwal, for the very rightly pointed out the importance of the webinar, importance of the grain like rice, which is a staple food for the more than half of the population, and the extent of where it is going to like serve, particularly in the salinity. And also, you also touched the water management issue, which is very, very important. And in the context of that, it is very appropriate, those remarks. I think we will be just dealing with those things, research and development during our deliberations. So now I will just uh, uh, hand over the, the, the this floor to Dr. Muhammad Saifuddin Abdul Rahman, sir, Director of Rice Paddy Research Center, Mardi, for his opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Muhammad Saifuddin, uh, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. It's a pleasure to meet you again. Uh, Dr. Shabel Taref, uh, Chief Operation and Development, uh, ICBA, uh, distinguished speakers, colleagues from Mardi and also from ICBA, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, salam alaikum, salam sejahtera, a very good morning, and also good, uh, good afternoon from uh, Malaysia and our colleagues uh, from UAE. I extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you as we gather here today for this highly anticipated webinar on enhancing rice production through effective salinity and water management strategies. I am delighted to see such a diverse group of expert researchers and professionals coming together to share and explore innovative solution in rice cultivation. Rice is one of the world most essential crops it plays a vital role in providing sustenance to billions of people across the globe. However, the challenges posed by salinity and water management in rice production are pressing concerns that demand our immediate attention. As global population increases and climate change intensifies, it is crucial that we address these issues with a sense of urgency and collaboration. We will explore the latest investment and best practices in managing salinity stress, ensuring sustainable water use, and optimizing rice production in various agroecological contexts. For example, breeding for salt tolerance rice involves employing various methods, including gene integration, marker assisted selection, a phenotypic selection which systematically enhance the ability of rice plants to tolerate high salinity levels, thereby ensuring sustainable rice production in saline affected areas, contributing to climate change adaptation efforts. Our esteemed panel of speakers from ex uh, and experts from Mardi and also ICBA have graciously agreed to share their expertise, experiences and research findings with us. Their diverse perspectives will offer invaluable insights into the multifaceted nature of salinity and water management for rice, shedding light on new methodologies and technological innovations that can contribute to overcoming these challenges. Furthermore, this webinar serves as an ideal platform to foster collaboration and knowledge exchange among participants. I encourage each of you to actively engage in discussions post question and contribute your own insights throughout the sessions. Together, we can forge new partnerships, identify effective strategies, 
and work towards a future with rice cultivation thrive even in the face of salinity and water-related constraints. Finally, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our partner Iqbal, who have supported this event, all distinguished speakers, as well as dedicated organizing team for hard work tirelessly toward to bring us together to this virtual event. I am confident that by the end of this seminar, webinar, we will gain valuable insight and force connection that will guide us toward a more resilient and productive future in rice farming. Thank you. I wish all of you a fruitful and engaging webinar. Terima kasih. Back to you, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you very much. Terima kasih, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Rahman. And uh, it's very rightly you mentioned about the global importance of rice sustainable water use efficiency and also you mentioned you touched that water particularly the uh, the gene integration and marker state selections so and also climate change and also the big collaboration part and this is the very important the collaboration is very important on this one so with this remarks thank you very much again for both of the distinguished uh, uh, guests dr jarwal trap and dr mohammed saifuddin so now i will start the the main proceeding, particularly on the presentation, there will be like a, some rules on that one. That will be like a 15 minutes presentation and 10 minutes Q and A session. And I think we would like to give enough time for question and answer, as Dr. Mohammed Sefuddin also mentioned. So please post your questions and uh, queries on the like a Q and A session in the Q and A notes, and that you can do it in that. That's uh, there is a share this chat screen and in that chat you can just post your questions and uh, i'm the first speaker but uh, i would like to just stick to the other speakers also 12 minutes after 12 minutes i will give a like a signal that it, it's three minutes more so after 15 minutes please stop or please conclude your presentation and we will give enough time to them so the first presentation is on breeding for rice breeding for soil tolerance in rice so I will be presenting that and then I will share the screen and then let me see if it's okay. Can you see my screen, please? Hello? Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet? Yeah. Not yet. How about now? Yes, it is coming. Yes, yes. now we can. The single screen, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So the topic of my presentation, I would like to be brief, but I have many hidden slides in case if you have the query, I will just discuss a bit later. So let me stop, start my stopwatch also. This is on the breeding for salt tolerance in rice. And The, the outlines of the lecture, is it this one or is, which screen is being shared? Single, can you see single screen or double screen? Single screen, extent of the problem, breathing strategy for salinity tolerance. Yeah, me, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. So not the uh, slideshow presenter. It's a single screen. Okay, great. So in this one, Sorry, sorry, sorry. My, so, sorry for this one. Shit.
I hope now it's okay. Yes. So the outline of lecture would be on the extent of the problem, the breeding strategy for salinity tolerance in the high yielding, and the screening techniques, because two different stages are very sensitive in the rise, not to the whole throughout the stage. And also on the tolerance versus growth stages and the dual tolerance, two in one breeding lines, because this is under the like a water logging area. Sometimes it is also submerged. So there's a two in one breeding lines we can develop little on the progress on the molecular aspect of salinity tolerance. And list of salt tolerant release variety and conclusion. So when we talk about Dr. Charval also mentioned about the extent of the area. If you see the extent that it is ranging from 340 million hectare to around 1.2 billion hectare. And he also mentioned the recent estimates of 1.4 billion hectares. South and Southeast Asia covers around 105 million hectare. It is both salt affected means like a saline soils and sodic soils. And in Africa, 85 million hectare. But I say always it is like a guesstimate because you know they are varying. So if you say whatever it is, it is area is very huge. In this one, if we talk about the rice, rice is a salt sensitive crop. If you talk about the like a threshold salinity, rice has threshold salinity of around three decimal per meter as per the mass amount, which is a, like a classical paper. And in this classical paper, you can see the rice is almost nest to the Arabidopsis but it is also having the like highest area in the staple crop one of the highest areas is uh, staple crop under the water log conditions while we barley barley is the most tolerant food crops in that one but it's still the rice is required why because of its biology its biology is there that it has erenchyma so it can sub, it can grow well under the water log conditions and what we talk about the plant response how the plant respond to the salt when it is effect, uh, like uh, experiencing the salt and salt is experienced mostly in the roots in some area it's also wind wind blow the salt in the some rlc etc but mostly it is affected in the root when it is affected in the root or it is uh, like uh, touching the root the plant immediately respond to that stress and that is through the osmoticum adjustment and that immediately inhibit the growth and stop the stomata, etc. That's why they say that, okay, you close this stomata because uh, something is wrong in the root. But immediately in the rice, maybe within the 20, 12 to 14, 24 hours, it overtakes by the toxic ion effect. And that's called the iron, the sodium and the chloride. They can affect the root and they try to enter in the root. And the best plant, the best genotypes, they can exclude the up to 98%. They are called good excluder. But those which are excluding only 90%, 92%, they are called poor excluders. So what the, the whatever amount of the salt goes in the plant, it is like even 2% in the older leaves or shoots, sheath, sheath, plant tissue, that called the tissue level or organ level partition. And that's one of the mechanism why which the plant becomes tolerant but that salt you can go you can see that in the glycophyte glycophyte means those which don't love the salt and halophyte which love the salt in the glycophytes there is no way that salt can come out once it is in it is in only in the gly on the halophytes there are salt gland salt uh, salt hairs and salt bladders which can throw the salt out again but it is not in the glycophyte so the next mechanism is the tissue tolerance, where the salt, once goes in the cell, it remains in the vacuole. It is partitioned in the vacuole. So it's a, like a cell level partition. It's called tissue tolerance. So why I'm telling that? Because this will be utilized in the next breeding program, what I'm going to explain on that. So the ideal high yielding salinity tolerant variety, it's a good, it should be good excluder, which, took, which should take only minimum per day uptake of sodium and highly tissue tolerant. Heads should be should have the support of the highest amount of the K per day uptake and low sodium potassium ratio. Good initial vigor, then it will dilute the effect of the higher concentration of salt and economical superior with the high yield potential. So if we are crossing the two varieties which are having a good excluder but having the poor tissue tolerant and the another variety which is not a good excluder but high tissue tolerant. So can we do that something together with that? And then we get the segregating material, which may have the different type of combinations. In these combinations, if we have like those things which are having the good excluder, like this one uh, with the tick, 
and the k higher k uptake and the vacuole is bigger so that that can accommodate more salt that type of genotypes are better so this is the main thing that how we can find out the best one this phenotyping is difficult but we will come to that how to do the phenotyping so how to screen the rice in the salinity tolerance there are two stages which i mentioned that these are the one is the seedling stage one is the booting stage these are the most sensitive stages in the rice not throughout the stage throughout the growth period rice is sensitive these are the two stages so we have to screen the rice in that these two stages and in these two stages this seedling stage is screening is very much standardized we can screen even up to the 2000 plants in maybe in the 2021 days this can be done very quickly but because it is a hydroponic based and you can see in this one like the green genotype it is a tolerant check so you have to always put the tolerant check and the sensitive check so in the stress sensitive check should die tolerant check should remain well uh, or green then it's a um, correct procedure you can see in this one this slide the fl478 which is a tolerant check it's surviving the others are dead and the 494 this genotype is also surviving it means it is good one so this is a standardized protocol using the modified yoshida nutrient solution culture and told assessment for 2 weeks and it is scored on the 1 to 9 scale of standard evaluation system you have to use both tolerant check as well as sensitive check however as we mentioned these two stages but these two stages are not related so the same fl478 which is sensitive which is very tolerant to seedling stage it is sensitive at the reproductive stage you can see this one the same variety which is a tolerant at seedling stage very tolerant is sensitive with the papery floret chaffy panical this is very sensitive at the reproductive stage so we can say that that if we screen at one stage it will it will uh, it will be okay to have the uh, stage with its uh, like uh, both stage could be screened together no you have to screen separately because these are the things which you have to do separately to have a plant or genotype which can grow throughout the salinity status throughout the growth period then for that reproductive stage you need to have the bigger plants structure at least something where you can have the facility to grow the full plant full adult plant stage and then you can screen and you can remove the plants even at the reproductive stage otherwise in the field it's very difficult so the best phenotyping parameters are the field and unfilled grains which are obviously a, like a associated with pollen fertility sodium concentration in the flag leaf which is the most uh, like a potent leaf which can which gives the around 60 to 70% food to the grain and grains per panicle and grain yield so when we talk about the breeding strategy definitely as we discuss about that crossing pattern of the identical genotypes and the different uh, mechanism but how to phenotype this is the main thing in case if we get some marker assisted selection or gene based markers or closely linked markers then it is better so the best thing is that in case if we have growth stage independent marker which is not affected by environment which is recessive and heterozygote combination can be distinguished non destructive quick repeatable and no epistasis so the molecular markers fits to fits to this criteria and ssr markers simple sequence repeats or even nowadays the snps are there which can be you know utilized for the molecular di uh, dissection of the plant so we started this thing a long back in 1997 with the one of the student uh, here the thesis in blen gregorio 97 we found some of the in ir29 pokali recombinant invariant lines rails the several qtls in this one of the qtl was the saltol it was very potent and very strong qtl and that qtl was like you know explaining around more than 40% of the salinity tolerance this was later on saturated with more markers with the more as like ssr markers and that is the one which is being utilized for the marker state breeding so first of the variety which was transferred from like a br28 which is a mega variety in bangladesh which was transferred uh, as a or you know the stress tolerance gene was transferred in that through the marker state breeding and that was the first one later on there were many other varieties in the asia the ir64 br29 br11 swarna sama masuri was also uh, converted to the marker that's uh, called sama masuri plus qtl of salinity tolerance and saltol swarna plus saltol something like that and in africa also we had done 
many many varieties which was in progress with the saltol marker so you can see this is the bangladesh you can see the br47 one of the variety in the left hand side it's a very tolerant but in the another variety which is not very sense which is sensitive which is not very tolerant it's not growing well and this br47 variety was released in different countries including the philippines also so these are the different varieties which are already developed and released in the philippines india bangladesh vietnam vietnam and uh, egypt and more varieties in bangladesh india and myanmar indonesia also they released two type two varieties which were the first time they released in the salinity and in the philippines so this is on the salinity and you can see the these things when we talk about the advantage upon the like a non stress variety or non stress tolerant variety stress tolerant variety versus what so people say that what is the advantage the advantage could be in many fold when you talk about the barren soil versus the productive soil so this is the another just uh, i will just touch this one this is very important particularly in the coastal salinity and in the malaysia part also very important we have the two troughs you can see the two troughs these are the sensitive stages where the salinity like uh, the plants are very sensitive seedling stage and reproductive stage and in this one particularly this when the plant are small at 3 4 5 or 6 7 week sometime there is a flooding because of the outflow of the rivers in the rainy season this particularly makes the scene scenario sometime like this so this is a field which is you can see this is a rice plants and that one and this is all submerged so in that submerged condition so there is a double type of stress two stresses salinity plus submergence and in that one we also release some variety which are and through this is also through the marker assisted selection because sub1 is a qtl is a robust qtl which is on the chromosome 9 saltol is on the chromosome 1 so this can be introgress together and we can have the variety which is two in one which is having the salinity plus submergence tolerance so we have the one variety release in the bangladesh one was released in the philippines so in the conclusion i think i did not take more than 15 minutes so rice is inherently salt sensitive crop but is still predominant in coastal and sodic areas rice is most sensitive at seedling stage and reproductive stage at and both controlled by different set of genes good diverse donors reliable phenotyping technique is the key to success both at the seedling and reproductive stage tolerance and two in one that's like a dual tolerance high yielding plant uh, high yielding plants with dual tolerance to salinity and submergence tolerance stresses using marker assisted selection and phenotypic are possible and that is ideal for the coastal area requirement so salinity tolerance in rice is a very complex stress otherwise to breed a good variety with a high tolerance throughout the growth period because it we need the good yield we have to have the tolerance to, throughout the growth period with this thank you very much for the your attention and now i will stop sharing and then the floor is open for the question and answer session thank you very much sorry i am the mc so i am asking anyone if somebody has query questions please uh, share dr rakesh yes please yes. how long it, it takes to develop uh, the varieties so uh, and uh, what is the best um, method uh, to shorten the 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 rnd parts in developing yeah. the varieties yeah two things particularly when you talk about the development of the variety irrespective of any stress it may take depending upon if you have one season then it may take 12 to 14 years if it is if you have two seasons then you, it may take 6 to 7 years but in case now you have the rga facility speed breeding people say about that mm -hmm. rapid generation advance if you have that you can develop the variety within like a 3 to 4 or 5 years at the most but this is irrespective of stress once it is a stress tolerance then we have to do the different path okay thank you thank you hello yes yes i can hear you yeah uh, thank you very much for the presentation this is i think it's going to be a breakthrough in the future uh, but i i thought uh, you will develop the varieties and maybe release them to you know for production 
now you uh, in view of your uh, answer to uh, Mr. Um, Muhammad Saifuddin, uh, you are proposing that countries develop their own uh, varieties. Is that is that correct? Yeah, there are two things. Particularly, uh, yes, we can we can train the people to develop the variety on their own, or we mm -hmm. can also utilize the facility to develop their material and then give a handover back to them to further train because you have to see the adaptation and the local adaptability of the variety in the country. If somebody breeds somewhere else and then you give them the variety as such and without testing the adaptability in the country, then it's not fair. So it is better to have the last stage of the variety, particularly at least in the country where it has to be uh, released. But we can always have the, like I say, we can always help to develop the variety. And th that way, if you see the list of the varieties in the red and black, some of the varieties were developed in the red, was developed by us. Some of them were developed by the partners and they were developed through the our crossing program and then we shared the material. And this is uh, for uh, dry production or wet production of rice? Dry, dry or wet, you say that, it, it means you are yes. talking about, yeah. yeah. So when we talk about the cropping system, like a, in different way, like why, how do you crop? If it is a dry system, it's an aerobic system. So aerobic rice is a different ball game. Drought tolerant, it's a different ball game. Today we are discussing on the salinity, but we can discuss that one in case if you want, because in the, that one, particularly in the dry system, in the aerobic system, people are talking about nowadays, the direct seeding to save the water to save the like you know timing also so that way it is a different ball game but that is also related with the early emergence so the traits which we talk about that sodium potassium etc and uptake of the sodium in the partitioning that will not matter in that one in that one it will be more on the early vigor and the weed competitiveness so that the screening trait becomes different when we are talking about the different breeding program Thank you. Thank I have you. several questions, but I don't want to, you know. You, you can, anyway. you can uh, send the email to me and we can address that. Okay, I'll try. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will write the email address to... Uh, all right. On my... So I have written my email address. Anybody can do that. You use that one and send the email. So in case if there are more questions, it's you are most welcome. But if it is not, then we can just go ahead with the second presentation. Is it okay? Can, can you show it again? Pardon? Can you show the email again on the screen? No, so, sorry, it is in the chat. I already put it in the chat. Ah, 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 all right. Yeah, okay. Okay, doc. Yeah. Actually, you know that I showed on, because this is a 15-minute regulation, so I showed only like just one-tenth of the slides, which is rest are hidden. So, because you can't put, it is a very big chapter, particularly when we do talk about the breeding for silicon tolerance. It's a very big, big issue. Okay, so next All presentation, right. I will just invite Mrs. Hello. Raineeza Binti Kamaruzaman. Hello. On, uh, yes. Yeah. I'm Fode Suma. Okay, Fode. Yeah. Uh, in terms of a salinity tolerance, I just want mm -hmm. to know whether there is a limit in which the, the, the crops are, are tolerant to this salinity stress. Because my experience this season, we tried several, the four varieties, the tolerant varieties sent to us from Iqba mm -hmm. during this dry period. So which normally uh, within our own area environment here, people do abandon their fields. So we had wanted to test them again. So on planting next day, what we experienced all the plants died off. I don't know where better 
because salinity there yeah, should be a tolerance level. Yeah. So, Dr. Forde, actually, yeah. when we talk about the salinity tolerance in the rice, it's mostly yeah. the seedling stage up to 12 decigem, but it doesn't mean that you have to grow all through because there is always salinity is a dynamic state. So, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. So, salinity tolerance at the seedling stage around 12 and reproductive stage up to 12, up to 10 decigem. So that's the main thing, which is the peak, which, which can be touched on that one. Because beyond that, if it is more than 15, it is already going into the helophytic category. So it's mostly 10 to 12 decigemon. It's good for rice to sustain, but it is not throughout the season, but it is also up and down, up and down. But the maximum is touching point, particularly for salinity tolerance is 10 at the reproductive stage and 12 at the seedling stage. Rest of the stage are okay to sustain the salinity. Okay, okay. Uh, that, because we tested okay. for salinity and the levels we are above 12, in fact, 12 the yeah. decimal meter. Okay. So, yeah. I okay. think that's the, that's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So now the Welcome. floor is of Mrs. Reniza Binti Kamarazuman. She is the research officer in breeding program on the Rice Research Center, Mardi. So floor is yours, Mrs. Thank Reniza. You. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, so good morning, uh, everyone in Dubai. So good afternoon, uh, everyone in Malaysia. So assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Um, my name is Reniza Binti Kamal Zaman. Uh, okay, I'm a research officer from breeding program of Rats Research Center Madi. So today I would like to share our some progress on evaluation of potential salt tolerant rice variety. Okay. Can you can you make it a full screen, please? Okay. Right. Is it okay now? Yes, correct. All right. Thank you. So, uh, my presentation will cover the introduction, a little bit information about our salinity pro salinity problem in Malaysia on our rice production area. And then the second part is the development of salt tolerant rice variety. We have uh, two strategy, which is the short-term strategy and the long-term strategy. And the last but not least, the conclusion. So uh, here in Malaysia, we only have a small area that were affected by the salinity. But in future, the climate change will, will contribute more on this problem. Uh, due to the due to due to the changes in the sea level and also increase in the tidal surge have led to saltwater intrusion into the low lying uh, coastal land area. So as we can hear in the uh, we can see here uh, in the image, uh, this is two main granary uh, in Malaysia in the northwestern coastline of Peninsular Malaysia. So this is the projection. Uh, of sea level uh, rising uh, in 2050. So this uh, this area will be severely impacted uh, okay, by 2,100, 2,100, causing about 20% of rice growing area to be completely flooded. Okay, so it happens in 2016. Uh, it was reported that seawater had entered the rice field near the Kuala Kedah, uh, the northern path as a result of high tides. And this uh, phenomenon affected uh, approximately about only 30 hectares of rice production area. And the yield losses is quite high, which is up to 75%. So the, this seawater will affect uh, the, the interfere the growth of the rice. Okay, so about the, the strategy uh, that we take in development of salt tolerant rice variety, in short-term strategy, we evaluate the uh, stable genotype, which is the, the variety, the advanced lines. Okay, and then we undergo the phenotypic and genotypic screening. And we uh, the selected one will be for the evaluated for your trial. And for long term, uh, we, we did the, the breeding. We did the crossing and then make a selection and follow the standard breeding procedure. Okay, uh, this is the method material method. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we screen, uh, we evaluate the genotypes that are already stable. So we choose a local varieties and advanced lines and as well as Asenrasnet from ERI program. So for saline ecosystem. And then we did the phenotypic screening 
uh, at six decisiment parameter concentration, salt concentration at reproductive stage, as, as Dr. Rakesh mentioned earlier. So we did a data collection on salt injury score and then genotypic screening using the molecular markers. Uh, for Acerasnet uh, uh, genotypes that uh, contain the Salto QTL. And then we did the selection of potential variety according to uh, good performance on physiological and morphological traits as well as your components traits. Okay, uh, before that, we did the pre preliminary trial, uh, preliminary trials. So we compare the effect of salt uh, in our rice. So we found that uh, the salt effect, the survival rate, chlorophyll index, gum height, uh, number of spikelet, field gram percentage, and 1,000 gram weight. So, uh, okay, back to the genotypes that we tested earlier. So this is the mean square. So we found that uh, salt injury score uh, is significantly different among the genotypes, as well as the percentage of field grain and 1,000 gram weight as well as yield per plant. So we proceed with the LSD uh, test. So we can see the salt injury score uh, IR29 is the susceptible check, uh, have the highest score, high score in salt injury. So as compared to the tolerant check, okay, for percentage of field grain, we can see the pokali have higher compared to RI29. So the rest, we will be use this data to select uh, the best uh, variety. Okay. And then we go for the year component, 1000 gram weight. Okay. So we can see here MRQ108 for 1000 gram weight. However, it has a lower yield per plant. So maybe have some issue with the uh, spicular sterility. Okay, so for you per plant, we found that uh, Salico 32. This is from ASEAN RASNET uh, entry. We found that this is the tolerant check from India, CSR 28. Okay, so if this variety is performed well in Malaysia, we can introduce to our farmers in future. So uh, we did a cluster analysis. So we've, we found about three groups that have the potential, uh, especially in terms of yield per plant, that we can uh, further evaluate it uh, in our field. Okay, so for genotypic screening, we screen only the acerasnet because uh, in our germplasm, in our breeding line, we do not cross uh, with salt, uh, any saltal donor. So we only screen the acerasnet uh, genotypes. So we found that uh, Salico 32, as I mentioned earlier, uh, CSR 28, uh, carry the KTL uh, region. Um, okay, next is Salico 12. 12, but um, we didn't select this uh, line because due to the morphological factors. So this is some pictures that we take we took during our trials. The tolerant genotypes grown under salt stress during productive stage. Okay, uh, this is the, the performance uh, of selected line, selected genotypes. So as I mentioned earlier again, uh, the Salico 32 uh, show the best performance with the higher yield, about 37.25 uh, year per plan. So followed by others. So uh, we have our local varieties, but we need to confirm uh, for the second season for this data. Okay, for the second strategy, for the long-term strategy, we, we did a breeding line. Okay, we crossed with the Pokali and the Salinas too from Philippines. Okay, this one is the mutant, if I'm not mistaken. So for the Saltol, uh, we did a crossing and we screened for the salto pre uh, QTL presence. And then we did uh, some back crossing to remove the unwanted traits. Okay, this is uh, the picture uh, for the tolerant check and the tolerant lines, as well as the sensitive line that we obtained as comparison. More pictures. 
for the tolerant and sensitive lines. And then uh, spikelet sterility, the peppery spikelet, as Dr. Rakesh mentioned earlier. Okay. So we found this uh, in our breeding lines. So we, we take this into consideration. Okay, uh, the last one is the class analysis of 13 potential. Line. We select only 13 that, uh, that can produce seeds until the end, uh, like the picture on the right side. Okay, so that one is quite good. So we found that uh, they have, we found that uh, SLO095 uh, is quite tolerant and we further, further screen this line until fixed. Okay, for the conclusion, uh, evaluation of potential subtolerant genotypes is a short-term strategy to introduce uh, for local use. Okay, while the integration of salto QTL or subtolerant trait uh, from the mutant line earlier in local liberty is a long-term strategy to overcome the sanity problem in respiratory area in Malaysia. So the selected 32 potential subtolerant genotypes that we found, uh, including the local genotypes and also from IRI, show a good performance when grown under soft stress condition at six decimal per meter and will be further evaluated in advanced trial. So the last part uh, for long-term uh, strategy, 13 breeding lines were identified as tolerant lines and will be further evaluated in the next generation. Okay, this is my reference and thank you for the collaborators for the support. That's all to you, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. You you consumed only almost 11 minutes only. So you have ample time and rather we have ample time for the question and answer session. Yep. So we can discuss. anyone who would like to have any questions to Mrs. Reniza on salinity, please feel free to have a query or question. Just to uh, mention about that, that uh, CSR28 is uh, both salinity tolerant at seedling as well as reproductive stage. It's a both stage tolerant variety. Oh, that's good. Yeah. We have a uh, very limited information about the CSR28. Maybe if uh, Dr. Rakesh, you have some information that we can use. Uh, so you you state that uh, this variety can overcome these two stages of plant growth uh, towards sub stress. So hopefully, yeah. yeah. How about the yeah, coverage? Is, I mean, this is this is a very good variety. Particularly, the only problem is that it has the seed grain shape. It is not log slender, so it's okay. a little bit bolder. But you can utilize that as a parent. All right. And I can tell you more about the CSR28, anything, even all the things, rather details, because actually it is my variety, which I developed when I was in India. <laughs> all right, that's great. Uh, we found the reader. So um, maybe so far, that's the only source uh, of modern Salto QTL that we have. Uh, before this, we use Pokali as a donor parent, so we mm -hmm. we need to do a lot of back crossings to eliminate the unwanted traits. So, yeah, yeah, better you use the some variety which are already improved one rather than Pokali. Otherwise, you will be having the linkage drag. Sure, right. So, anybody would like to have any query or question? Please feel free. This is the time to raise any query question you can find out now. So one of the chat says that were these varieties cultivated in only one environment or were your trial done in the different environment? So were they tested only in the one environment or were they tested already on the multi-environment testing? So because, okay, uh, may I answer this? that question. So uh, we just uh, begin our evaluation. So in, we plan to have a multi-location trial uh, so that uh, the variety that we identified can perform under non-stress and also the sub-stress condition. Yep. So currently it is uh, tested at the station only? Uh, yes, uh, in the glass house. 
and recently we just planted in the sum of uh, saline soil area and we will see the performance uh, if uh, there is a survival from that the plot so we will proceed to the other plots that we usually did our test our trial yeah so means like once you get the uh, re like replicated yield trial then only it will be more conclusive yeah. and what are the rice stages what rice stages are most sensitive to salinity stress you answer that actually i already explained but you can answer more Okay, uh, I think Dr. Rakesh already mentioned in his presentation, but I will uh, say it again. So there, is, there are two stages that are sensitive to salt stress, which is the ceiling stage and also the booting stage, uh, and are using the reproductive stage as the, uh, for booting stage. So. Yeah, just to add on that, uh, these, as Mrs. Raniza mentioned, these are the two stages which are most sensitive, but other stages you can have like more uh, salt they can withstand. The only problem with that salinity seedling stage you can escape because you are doing sometimes the seedling or nursery. So you can do the nursery in some good place and then you can transplant at the little bit uh, bigger nursery or older nursery to escape that. But reproductive stage cannot be escaped because that the plant is already in the field and you cannot remove them. So that plant has to be have the reproductive stage tolerance to have the good yield because there is a direct correlation in the reproductive stage salinity tolerance with the yield production yield or you say grain production. Can I put a question, please? Please, please, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it seems to me that uh, this. I mean, uh, Mr. Rahanze uh, program is more or less is a, it's a through selection. Uh, yeah, but, but my question is, what is the relation between Mardi's and Akbar's programs? Is it, I mean, uh, complementing each other or uh, it? it No, it seems to be this I is. I can say different. that it is more on the technical backstopping. It's more on the, and uh, there is a uh, yani cooperation between the two programs, and yani. Uh, so, because it seems to me that the the stations are different, the the staff are different, the strategies. Uh, so, you are trying to complement each other. Yes, Dr. Radhavan. Actually, we are complementing each other in terms of the technology. That's why I mentioned to uh, Ms. Reniza also about the material, uh -huh. about those things which we can, uh, like, a, yeah. even if I'm out, because, you know, I was in Erie for more than 14 years before joining yes. ICWA. So those uh -huh. materials which we got, it's also from the Erie and those strategy, also standard evaluation system, etc. Even the marker tolerance, marker for the salt tolerance, etc. Yeah. It's from the my program before. Yeah, okay. And uh, please uh, forgive me for my ignorance. Uh, MARDI is, uh, stands for what? Uh, Malaysian Agricultural Research and Development Institute. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, to no problem. No problem. Comment on that. Uh, because uh, actually, under the 12th Malaysian plan, uh, five years, we just uh, started uh, doing uh, extensive research in uh, biotic and abiotic stress, including salinity, uh, flooded, and also uh, uh, drought tolerance uh, varieties. So um, our top management have been uh, in 2021, I think very close to ICBA. And then we have a, a MOU with ICBA, and then we want to proceed further with research collaboration. And uh, I think salinity uh, since uh, Dr. Rakesh is a very experienced person from Iri and uh, until now, then uh, we uh, need to put a lot of uh, effort in engaging 
this uh, collaboration so that uh, maybe Iqba can uh, help us in, ter in terms of uh, technicality in produce uh, biotic uh, or abiotic stress, uh, uh, salinity or whether uh, drought or some other climate uh, change uh, problem uh, in, in the future. Uh, because for your information, um, uh, salinity now in Malaysia is just a minimal area that uh, had been affected. Not not many areas have been affected by salinity. Also, just to add on that, uh, when I joined here, then we started working on the rice. Also, we just got some material from Bangladesh Biri, Bangladesh Rice Research Institute. We developed. Uh, the screening technique, etc., and because our domain is in sub-Saharan Africa, so we just uh, tested, we just uh, like uh, fine-tune those those things, and we just material transferred to the Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, our project in there. So you can see that uh, Dr. Ford Suma, he was he, he is uh, in one of the West African country. He is our collaborator. So they are using those same technique because we just good got those all the technique in the Iqba. And we tested it. We grew. Uh, rice Dr. Rakesh, here. we may proceed with next uh, presentation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So actually, I I had time. That's why I was thinking to utilize that time. So we are not uh, behind the schedule now. We can go with the next presentation. Uh, the it is by Dr. Khalil Ammar. He's a program leader on sustainable natural resource management, and his topic is coastal aquifer management to control seawater intrusion. Over to you, Dr. Khalil Ammar. Yeah, thank you, Dr. RK, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope, do you see my uh, screen? Yeah, can you make it a full screen, please? Yes. <clears throat> yes, correct. Okay. So the, the topic that I will talk about, it's more about the water resources and the water resources management, particularly in the coastal aquifer uh, systems, uh, where seawater intrusion usually is a big problem. And it's a growing um, problem worldwide because of uh, the increasing uh, water demand due to the economic growth and population growth and many other stresses that needs more water. Uh, the typical uh, situation usually is to have an ideal uh, water resources management plan and uh, for a long term that can sustain the, the water use and also the water resources in uh, the coastal aquifers and, and, and on the basin level uh, without disturbing the hydrological cycle. So any component that will be changed in this hydrological cycle can lead to have effect on the water system, either the aquifer system or even the watershed or uh, surface uh, water system. Therefore, um, uh, it's very important to understand the root causes of the seawater intrusion uh, in each specific uh, coastal aquifer systems and uh, see what are the key parameters that are causing this seawater intrusion. And because it's uh, site specific differs from one country to another, even from one, one basin or one aquifer within the basin to another. Uh, and it's, uh, as we said, it's a very serious and uh, issue because it affects the agriculture, the sustaining agriculture productions and livelihood in the, for the, of the coastal communities. And not only for growing uh, rice, but also for all types of crops that are grown in uh, these coastal aquifers, particularly in the water scarce countries, where the, usually the renewable recharge is much less than the abstracted water. And therefore, uh, we can see that uh, looking at uh, either it's a human effect or it's natural effect, or even with the climate change impact now, we expect that uh, due to the sea level rise that more seawater intrusion could occur in the coastal aquifers, which will pollute or cause uh, changing the quality of the water, then make it restricted for different uses instead of open for many other uses or the fresh water use as usual. 
And this, as I said, uh, it could be uh, due to the poor land and water management and the practices, or could be to the changes in the land use uh, and the planning, uh, like uh, ex the extension of the urbanization uh, and also the changes of the uh, of the uses within the different uh, watersheds and the aquifer systems. And uh, therefore, it's important to understand and look uh, in, 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 uh, on the real causes and try to see what are the best solutions to overcome uh, this uh, seawater intrusion. And uh, we know that uh, most of the agricultural uh, areas, like in our region and MENA region, they rely upon groundwater resources and groundwater wells, which were uh, put in terms of the location of the farms maybe not based on well-defined um, uh, plan or uh, understanding of the hydrogeology and the aquifer systems that are available. And because of this, uh, most of these uh, coastal aquifers were depleted and uh, the water level dropped sharply and caused uh, seawater intrusion uh, to replace the water that was extracted. Because as we said, maybe the limitation of the uh, recharge from our natural recharge from uh, the rainfall and also from the lakes and the rivers that were uh, working. Here in our region, we have also wadis that also contribute or used to contribute uh, to the minimum environmental flow that can put on uh, the seawater intrusion from coming. With the changes of these dams, building dams everywhere also affected causing this uh, seawater intrusion. And uh, there are, luckily, there are good mitigation strategies that could be used uh, to halt or stop the, or reduce the effect of seawater intrusion, uh, which we like mostly is we call it maybe conventional or the most direct uh, method, which is the reduction of dumping and relocation of dumping wells. And some physical barriers, uh, which also could be a solution for site specific, as we said, solutions or problems, a uh, solution for some of the problems could be subsurface barriers or could be physical uh, surface barriers. And we have the hydraulic, bar uh, hydraulic barriers, like using or relying on artificial uh, recharge uh, or abstraction barriers or combined barriers, as I explained in the final slides. For the conventional uh, methods for controlled seawater inclusion, uh, we rely upon, as I said, on uh, looking at how much we are over abstracting uh, the aquifer uh, and the coastal area. Therefore, we need to understand what is the safe yield of this aquifer, how much we should abstract without uh, causing any depletion or drop in the water level so we can sustain the aquifer system. Unfortunately, this is not done mostly in many places due to the lack of monitoring uh, wells that can. Uh, report and uh, alarm for such uh, situations, or maybe because it's, uh, the agriculture is where they're, uh, and uh, they own their uh, agricultural wells and they're using this water. So controlling it uh, can create some social impacts and uh, it will be difficult to control it uh, due to some political decisions. And, uh, but we can still uh, do a lot in terms of having a better management to see how much we can reduce the bumping by changing the cropping pattern to see uh, what are the best crops and varieties that can tolerate maybe different water qualities. And also at the same time can uh, use uh, water more wisely and then uh, reduce the high water consuming crops or um, grow it in the other area or more in depth in the inland bar. And uh, with the modern irrigation technologies and uh, precision agriculture and uh, also the, uh, the use of the sensor systems, it also became more uh, easy uh, to, um, to control the, and have more savings of the water in terms of the use in uh, the different, for irrigating different crops to uh, give the right quantity of water at the right time with the right quality. And uh, this also can save uh, the water and also can save the energy and save the nu uh, nutrients uh, and uh, have less, uh, less uh, uh, pollution. Uh, because of this, we work a lot in ICTA on different crops, what are the best water requirements, 
and how we can uh, develop the, the best methods to have more accurate estimates, even using remote sensing exercises, which is widely used now also in many other countries and also institutions. So this can also ease uh, and help the, the countries and institutions to have better management uh, all over the basin or all over the aquifer. And uh, it's a promising solution that can uh, be applied widely and be scaled out in different places. The other solution could be also uh, reallocating the wells because sometimes, uh, as we saw there, uh, there was a core with what we call it core of depletion, where uh, we can see that the water uh, drops and causes uh, like a, a shape of a cone. This also uh, needs to um, study carefully using uh, like a numerical modeling or groundwater flow and transport modeling to see what are the best uh, locations of these wells that would not affect or cause sharp drop in the water levels. And we did some uh, study uh, before a while for uh, Oman's uh, Sultanate of Oman, where we looked at uh, seawater inclusion in uh, the coastal aquifer uh, of Al Batina, and we showed how these agricultural uh, areas and wells use these uh, or cause some seawater inclusion and we showed them if the business as usual will continue in the future then more seawater inclusion will enter the aquifer and will be pollute and cause uh, more damage to the aquifer so there should be some uh, demand management uh, for what to grow where and when and also use some maybe other alternatives like uh, treated wastewater or desalinated water or rainwater harvesting and other solutions that we can add to have an integrated water resource management uh, in general. Uh, but also uh, this can uh, be done through using uh, numerical models that we can allocate exactly where are the best locations that can we optimize the location of the wells and also the amount of water that could be extracted from these wells. And this can sustain the agricultural production and also uh, protect the aquifer and coastal aquifer system from uh, pollution or degradation. Um, we, there are, as we said, several other uh, solutions like physical barriers uh, to control seawater intrusion, but usually uh, this could be um, uh, site specific, could be uh, and it worked in some countries, like having a wall that at uh, location of the sea water interaction with the fresh water that can prevent uh, seawater intrusion. But it would be uh, the applicability of this on a longer uh, line of the coast could be costly and also the installation and investment in this could be also costly. But it depends upon the case and severity of the case. Uh, you, we can decide what are the best solutions that could be applied. Another method for uh, physical surface barriers could be to add, uh, um, like extend the, uh, the land um, and have more soil added uh, to increase the land area. So you can push or have more uh, zone or uh, margin for the fresh water, uh, groundwater and stop the sea water. This could be also another area where applicable and if it's possible to apply it. But the cost should be also, and visibility, technical visibility should be studied carefully. Uh, what we like more is the hydraulic barriers contra seawater intrusion, which mostly uh, is done by artificial uh, artificial recharge using either uh, lakes and recharge dams or recharge wells, and then you can increase the inland uh, groundwater level so it can halt or uh, stop the seawater intrusion. This work in many areas and many places, but the source of water for this uh, recharge could be the rainwater harvesting or the wadi or the river uh, uh, ex uh, like extra water that could be gained or collected from the main tributaries or treated wastewater. Or sometimes in places where it is extreme, also it's possible to, do, to use desalinated water. It could also be added and used. Um, for protecting or stopping the seawater intrusion. And um, uh, because of this, it's important to understand, as we said, uh, where we can use this uh, recharge uh, injection wells and also uh, the exact location that can uh, benefit better the aquifer system. Another method is the abstraction barriers, where they install a pumping well on the side of the seawater uh, interface. 
that can uh, make a drop in the water uh, level there and then can stop the seawater inclusion. This can make more margin for the increasing the fresh groundwater on the other side of the fresh water, and this can prevent uh, more seawater inclusion. So there are many ideas that needs to be um, uh, discussed carefully and also look at the all technical and the visible uh, financial and economic visibility of each of these. And also there are some methods that combine with three, charge and three minutes remaining, Dr. Kreel. Yes, I'm coming to it. That can be also used as a full system of uh, wells of recharge and abstraction that can maintain the seawater intrusion from uh, or help the seawater intrusion. There are some other methods like what we call aquifer storage and recovery, where you can inject the uh, surplus of the water uh, at the times when it is not needed and inject it in the groundwater uh, aquifer and then extract it when it is needed. This could also be, could be a good solution to uh, reduce the effect of seawater intrusion. And also sometimes we use uh, treated wastewater for injection and also as a hydraulic barrier sometimes to stop the sea water from entering to the aquifer system as in uh, Oman or Salala area where they use the treated wastewater there as in a uh, hydraulic barrier, but it needs to be treated carefully and with the high standards to protect the, uh, the aquifer system. To conclude, um, seawater intrusion, as we said, is a growing challenge due to the increasing water demand in the future. And it affects uh, negatively, unfortunately, the uh, community livelihoods. And it, it, it is anticipated to continue if uh, the right measures are not taken immediately. And there should be integrated water source management planning that looks at all the uses and all the inflows and outflows and come up with a better solution on uh, basin and also aquifer system and the interaction between the surface and the groundwater and the all water resources that comes as inflow. And what are the, are the outflows to have a better management of our overall management. Optimizing the location of the coastal wells and also the rate of pumping is also important. This could be done with different models and tools, and uh, this can also uh, optimize the and provide an economic solution and maybe more sustainable solution for the system. The system. And uh, as we said, uh, these hydraulic and uh, physical barriers can be significant role for site-specific locations, uh, but it's better to rely on the better management and better planning for the long term to sustain the aquifer system instead of looking for these maybe costly solutions. Yeah, that's all what I wanted to tell you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khalil, for the nice presentation and a very important issue, particularly in the coastal agriculture. So the floor is open for the discussion. Can you stop uh, sharing the screen so that people can? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can I make a comment, please, or a question? Yes, please. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Khalil. This is very, really, very important. I. It seems to me that the this program is not uh, yeah, designed uh, for rice only. It's for uh, yeah, any. Um, other crops. Uh, my comment is, have you uh, evaluate the, let's say, the uh, reduction and intrusion of seawater through natural uh, recharge? Because I think uh, in, the, in the view of the climate change these uh, days, uh, I don't know, we hear that in some cases we have huge rainfall uh, storms in, in the coastal area or in the in the Gulf area. Can you uh, shed some light on, I'm sure you might have some something in mind for to, uh, to exercise the, the water harvesting program for uh, recharge of, 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 of the groundwater in, in the region in the coastal area. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, what, what I presented is, it applies not only for rice, as I said, it applies for all the crops, like yes, yes. the water inclusion, the coastal aquifers, uh, yes. is a well-known phenomena and the problem worldwide. And uh, many crops are uh, grown in these coastal uh, aquifers, like dates here in the GCC and uh, North Africa and many other locations and uh, maybe forages and other uh, uh, water consuming crops. Rice is also what applies to these, applies also, for example, on the, the rice. What we did here with the, in collaboration with Dr. Uh, uh, Arke and his team also, we tried to understand the crop water requirements of the rice, then we can manage it better in terms of using modern irrigation systems instead of flooding and any other methods that we can develop and use it for having uh, more accurate estimates of the actual water use. Uh, regarding the recharge of uh, the coastal aquifer system, uh, we did, as I said, uh, some studies for Oman and the uh, UAE uh, to understand the interaction between surface water and groundwater, but it was under also uh, an overview or a policy or a strategy for the whole country. Because of this, you need to look at the strategic uh, solutions and methods and uh, look at uh, where are the potential uh, areas that could be improved. Now, we did some projects in collaboration with the uh, IEA, uh, the International Atomic uh, Organization, uh, where we tried to use the isotopes to understand um, the um, uh, efficiency of the recharge dams. Uh, like here in UAE, for example, they have built several recharge dams uh, to improve the groundwater uh, quality and also quantity, and uh, to help uh, improve uh, the uh, watershed or the wadis uh, in these areas. So understanding the efficiency of the different uh, recharge uh, dams, which collects the storm water or rainfall uh, in, from the mountainous parks, uh, is a very important study here done also from many other institutions and universities. And there are many uh, also literature that are uh, applied here and uh, published uh, on these uh, topics. So when we look at the uh, um, uh, strategic or uh, documents that we prepare, we looked at all these examples and we look at some uh, site specific examples that we work with uh, the ministries here at home. Uh, to help and understand more how we can benefit from these studies, to understand how we can sustain uh, the, uh, the groundwater system and uh, stop the degradation, uh, the quality and also the quantity, quantity and the drop in the water level. So it's uh, uh, mostly responsibility of the governments and institutions to have the right monitoring systems in place and to see the right, uh, to put the right action to control and see the efficiency of the dams and the irrigation systems and all these uh, measures that they put in place. So it's not uh, one, one solution, but it's uh, more of management of the water resources and the efficient management of water resources. Sorry, can you stop sharing the screen? Who is there? Yeah, I stopped. No, not you. Somebody else has shared the screen. And there is a one query, Dr. Khalil, on the chat. Uh, what about studies, researches working on the duration, time scale needed to reverse the seawater intrusion and reinstalling the groundwater layers to stop depleting the return back natural freshwater situation if it's possible. And also I will request both the presenters to write their email on the like, box with the with the, everyone. So then they can they can just respond to the any query or question later on. Dr. Khalil, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Akram, for an excellent question. As you know, uh, we work also with you and uh, your team on uh, different strategies in uh, UAE. Uh, it's, it's sometimes it's uh, very difficult to reverse the effect of the seawater. Uh, at the best we can maybe halt or stop the seawater intrusion because when the seawater enters the aquifer, it affects the quality of the aquifer system and then limits its uses. Uh, re, um, uh, treat or uh, solve this, uh, uh, what, what has entered 
is costly mostly, like uh, bind, bind treat and then inject again with fresh water. It, and it takes a, long, a lot of time and it takes also uh, it needs a lot of money. But sometimes the best we can do is to stop uh, the seawater inclusion at the level at that it decreased uh, from degrading more and let it take a long time for uh, adding all these uh, measures that we mentioned in terms of better uh, water demand management and also adding non-conventional water resources in terms of the treated wastewater or desalinated water or other types of rainwater harvesting and others to be used and also added as a recharge or added as a direct use, which also could have a better pollution at the end. This on the long run uh, will improve the quality of the aquifer, and but it will take time for sure. But I don't think it's visible uh, to uh, treat uh, what has uh, already infected. Because of this, it's better to protect the aquifer system rather than to pay a lot for treating it later in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Kareem. So now we can please write your email address, Rainiza. This is Reniza and Dr. Creel on the like chat so that people can approach you whenever they have any query or something at a later, later time. So now I will request our fourth and last speaker on the water management for rice production in Malaysia, Mr. Muhammad Hanif Ahmad, research officer Mardi. The floor is yours, Dr. Muhammad, and you can upload your presentation now. Yes, we can see your screen. Good. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, correct. We can hear you well, and then also we can see the screen. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a good day to every everyone. Okay, my name is Muhammad Hanif from Malaysia. Uh, I'm a research officer, engineering research center, Madis Bamprai, Penang. Today, I would like to share about the water management for rice production in Malaysia. Okay, this is a, a, a content of the presentation. Uh, first is introduction, strategies and approach, issue and challenges, way forward and conclusion. Okay, water source in Malaysia, we have uh, uh, two major source which is a surface water and groundwater, which is a surface water is a 97% use rather than a groundwater, only a 3% groundwater use. So it is from the 150 major river basin and four dam that use for uh, uh, water resource in Malaysia. And only 1% usage on the irrigation and 2% for industry and domestic from the groundwater. So for the uh, surface water, uh, rice irrigation is uh, uh, contribute about 50 uh, use, usage about 51% uh, of uh, water resource compared to the domestic and industry 33% and followed by other crops, so, uh, fisheries 7 and 8% and lastly is the livestock. So for the paddy areas, the total planted area is about uh, 689,000 hectare, which is uh, a 12 granary area, uh, uh, all from the Peninsula Malaysia and Sabah and Sarawak, from uh, 10 in Peninsula Malaysia and two in Sabah and Sarawak. So for the source of water paddy area, 54% uh, was complete irrigation and drainage. And uh, another 46% uh, is a rain fed area. So in Malaysia, we have uh, several uh, area that uh, cause a saline soil area, which is, uh, we, you can see at the map, uh, the green map, you can see the peninsula Malaysia. The red one is the severe uh, of the saline soil area. So the irrigation water supply, uh, we have a three main water source for irrigation. 
First is the rainwater is contribute about 52%. Uncontrolled river flow is about 20%. Uh, reservoir release uh, from dam about uh, 27%. And others, uh, which is uh, water recycling and groundwater about 1%. So uh, the the main the, the main source of uh, water in Malaysia is a uh, uh, from the rainfall, which is occur during the southwest monsoon and the northeast monsoon. You can see the map uh, how the how the southwest monsoon uh, contribute uh, average monthly rainfall for from June to August for the southwest monsoon and the east coast monsoon during the December, January, and February. Um, this is the main uh, water source that uh, Malaysia uh, needs for the storage, uh, paddy storage uh, water requirement. Okay, this is a uh, uh, mid annual rainfall at the Madis Bamprai station from the 1999 to 2019. Uh, there is uh, two main season that we can plant uh, uh, rice, uh, which is a main season during the August to February, and uh, March from the uh, for the off season is a March to August. Okay, this is the other rainfall pattern uh, from uh, others granary area, which is the, the, the biggest area, uh, granary area, which is Mada. Also same, uh, we can plant it for two season, uh, from the March to July, uh, August, and uh, from August to December. So this is uh, our irrigation infrastructure. We, we have a, a dam, a pump station, the uh, control, uh, delivery controlling structure, which is I have a automated gated and a barrage for the uh, control the water level. Okay, this is a comparison of infrastructure density in granary. Uh, the most uh, the most uh, density is about uh, in Besut and Barat Laut Selangor, which is have a uh, forty three meter per hectare, and Besut about uh, forty eight meter per hectare. This is uh, the most uh, Barat Laut Selangor is the most uh, uh, modern the, mon the modern water management uh, uh, infrastructure that. Uh, 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 manage the water very uh, good. Okay, this is our uh, complete scheme. You can see the the drainage, the water gate, uh, the planted area is most the uniform, uh, uniform and very designed by the engineers. So this one is an incomplete scheme. You can see uh, the uh the planted the, the area of paddy is uh mostly uh owned by individual uh individual uh, uh, owns uh paddy planted plant so uh the water distribution is uh not in complete scheme so uh this is uh another uh part of the uh water management in Malaysia. Okay, for the approach and uh, uh, strategies that we have uh, is uh, an alternative water resource for PD is water recycling system, pond storage, uh, drainage recovery system, shallow groundwater, and uh, tip well or tip well system. So the concept of uh, water recycling is uh, you harvest the water uh, from the rainfall and the excess water flow into the storage pond. So uh, the water is collected at the storage pond and during the drought uh, or dry season, the water from storage pond is pumped to fill again. So this is uh, uh, the concept of water recycling. So uh, this is a data from uh, our uh, uh, water recycling system 
from the 2014 to 2019, uh, we can uh, save the water about 27% uh, of irrigation water from the cycling pond, and the rest is from the rainfall. So uh, uh, it's not outside water or we, 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 we doesn't have any outside water from the uh, 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 local authorities. Okay, this one of uh, another approach that we have is a drainage recovery system. Uh, this uh, type of system is enabled to drainage uh, water to be recycled for strategic agriculture areas. The recycling pump contribute about 17% uh, of the water release from the reservoir. And this uh, type of uh, system was implemented by MADA, which is the, the most uh, biggest uh, granary area in Malaysia. Okay, uh, another approach that we have, we can uh, construct the infrastructure of shallow well system uh, uh, at the area which is uh, most of the groundwater uh, availability. So this is uh, uh, the shallow uh, area, uh, almost about 20 meter to 30 meter uh, depth. Okay. So uh, there is uh, so many, uh, at the IADA Pulau Pinang, there is uh, 34 tube well have been built around uh, granary area to, to prepare for the dry season. So uh, and, uh, for approach uh, in method of irrigation in Malaysia, in Malaysia we, we use the continuous basin irrigation which is a uniform depth throughout the growth cycle, and also the intermittent basin irrigation, which is the depth according to the growth stage. Okay, for the intermittent uh, basin irrigation, uh, uh, there is a, a stage that uh, a different stage, standing water depth is controlled according to the growth stage, which is uh, for the direct seeding, uh, from the five days to seven days after sowing, uh, we need about a 2.5 cm centimeter and five centimeter. And this is for encourage the seedling growth and weed and pest control. Uh, for the crop establishment, uh, 15 uh, below, uh, five to 10 centimeter uh, deep, which is uh, for the weed control, improve the seedling, development. Uh, from 15 to 14, 45 uh, day after sowing, uh, the water depth uh, decreased to 2.5 to 5 centimeter to encourage the root development and to improve the tailoring. Uh, during the panicle initiation, uh, the water uh, needs uh, more uh, for the uh, more sensitive uh, water stress and this is uh, the insurance for the high yield. And the, the last one is the drainage. Uh, drain, uh, we drain out all the water uh, for the fasten uh, the grain for ripening. Okay, uh, we also uh, apply the water monitoring system and irrigation automated control gate that we can uh, monitor the water level, uh, water level at the field. So we can, uh, 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 control the water loss and uh, avoid the overflow uh, to the uh, drainage. Okay, this is a water uh, gate that uh, can control uh, for uh, water throughout uh, to the field. So we can uh, manage the water more efficient and uh, uh, based on the water requirement. Okay, this is a water monitoring system. This is an IoT base, which is a water level. Uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, monitor the water level measurement, follow flow measurement, and control the irrigation schedule by monitoring the water level of ready. We can optimize and uh, help uh, for water uh, saving and also have a crop yields uh, and crop management also. Okay, this is an automated uh, control gate. 
as you see before. Okay, uh, for the drainage area, uh, there is a, a dual purpose that we can uh, uh, control the uh, overflow from the uh, near uh, mangrove breakage water uh, forest, which is uh, uh, more of uh, during the tide or high tide, the backwater from the nearest river that uh, have a breakage water can uh, go inside the, the field. So some of the area uh, was uh, uh, developed the flood control gate and uh, also the control panel for uh, control the uh, uh, breakage water go inside the paddy field. And it is a dual purpose also for the drainage system that it will also co collect the water from the field uh, uh, when the excessive water. Can you wrap up with the three more minutes, please? Okay, okay. this is a tidal control gate. That uh, tidal control gate is a, can be used to control water level in low lying agriculture areas. Okay, this, uh, this uh, infrastructure was developed in the nearest river, which is uh, more uh, risk for the um, seawater uh, overflow to the uh, low-lying agriculture areas. It can prevent from the salt water into the uh, agriculture areas, and it can be balanced between the fresh water and salt water. Okay, for the issue and challenge, uh, in Malaysia, we have a so uh, uh, area that incomplete irrigation scheme, and sometimes uh, there is a no irrigation infrastructure. And to 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 uh, to construct the the pond or the storage area, there is a lack of area we can find because of uh, the the high cost and the. Uh, and also at the uh, coastal area to we, to construct the groundwater is uh, is more difficult because the salt water intrusions and also the climate change and uh, some of area for paddy are uh, most uh, convert from the uh, more individual area are converts from paddy field to re residential area. So uh, for way forward and conclusion, irrigation system, the implementation of efficient and modern irrigation systems such as control flooding or alternate wet and dry with the IoT system can optimize water usage in rice field and improve water distribution leading to higher water use efficiency. For water availability, Malaysia abundant of rainfall and extensive river network provide a significant advance advantage for rice cultivation. However, uh, maintaining uh, proper water availability throughout the culti uh, cultivation cycle, the cycling system, uh, and groundwater during the uh, dry spell. Effective water storage and distribution system, including reservoir, canals, and water management infrastructure, ensure a reliable water supply for rice field. For water quality, along the uh, with the quantity, water quality is important for rice cultivation, ensuring that irrigation water is free from contaminants and excessive salinity is vital for healthy crop growth. And number four is a sustainable practice, which is uh, embracing a sustainable agriculture practice is essential for long-term water management in rice cultivation. Implementing techniques like uh, precision uh, irrigation, soil tolerance variety, Adopting conservation uh, practice and reduce can reduce uh, water usage and minimize environmental impact. And last for all, research and innovation. Uh, continue research and innovation in water management techniques specifically to rice cultivation are crucial. This includes developing new irrigation techniques, modeling of water resource and aquifer, improving uh, crop varieties for water efficiency, and promoting farmer education education and training on efficient water management practice. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad. So you already gave very extensive 
uh, extensive holistic scenario about the water management in the whole Malaysia and it, especially with the rice rice uh, ecology. Thank you very much. And now floor is open for the discussion. Can you stop the sharing the screen? Okay. Any anyone who has any query question with Mr. Muhammad? He already explained the very extensive system, water management system in the Malaysia, and that too, not only with the rice, but the other crops as well, and rice in particular. People can take the advantage, though he has already mentioned his uh, email address, I think, isn't it? Mr. Mohammed, have you put your email on the chat? Okay. If not, please, yeah, please do that. So that in case if uh, people have any query and question even later and later uh, later stage, they can just respond to you. Thank you. So anyone who has any query question? So uh, Mr. Mohammed, just to start on that one particularly, when you say that uh, you have like a 51 percent is uh, irrigated and around 49 percent or 48 percent is the rain fed so the water system in the uh, like uh, in the rain fed area it's also controlled through some channels etc or do they have the facility to provide rice uh, provide water to the rice from the like a uh, stored area stored water area or they uh, don't have it's completely rain fed completely rain fed yes okay so so the major problem because the major problem in the malaysia because i found that in the literature it's around 50000 hectares in the salinity but mostly it is the drought uh, yes in the coastal area so uh now we are working on that for the uh, how how to manage the uh, how to uh, find the alternative uh, alternative uh, water resources to mm -hmm. uh, uh, to uh, to make it a supplementary uh, because the rain fed is still the uh, the most important thing uh, and the uh, the season uh, the season the seasonal cycle also we need to uh uh research because uh this is a uh, most on the specific the rain fed pattern area so uh some modeling needs to uh come out for this area that um uh mostly there is uh this uh 50000 uh sort uh saline area is uh uh, most of them is uh, the origin is from the mangrove mangrove okay. uh, breakage water area so okay maybe some of the hydrological and modeling maybe we can, we can come up next okay thank you anybody who has any query to mr Mohammed, any excuse me yes please please go ahead Okay. Thank you for Ikra, thank you for you and Dr. Khalil, and thanks for doctors from uh, Malaysia. Really, I just want to, in general, to ask about one thing about uh, two-in-one genotype. Okay, you talk about that point, the submergence and the salinity tolerance. How to yes, collect these two diverse traits together if they have high heavy raining season with salinity soil? It's already just washing uh, area by the rainfall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How to do that? Yes. How yeah, to test? Yeah. How to evaluate this uh, what two in one genotype? Yeah. As uh, as the I mentioned in the, my presentation, I think this is regarding my presentation. In in my presentation, if you remember that, particularly yeah. in the coastal area, there is high tide and low tides. During the high yes. tide and high rainfall area, the salinity of the water is also a little bit higher. And if there is a submergence, 
and submergence alone is not that detrimental than the submergence with the saline water. So that becomes very, very big issue. And then a large area under the coastal area, which is having this problem, and they can have like a submergence of around four to five days because submergence gene can tolerate the submergence up to 14 days. But in the normal without submergence gene, it can tolerate only rise four days. So if it is submergence for more than four days, but if it is a submergence with the salinity, even the four days is very yeah. detrimental. So that's why the two in one is the boon and I'll now almost all the variety in the coastal area are having submergence plus salinity tolerance together. Oh, yes, I got it. And uh, another question about the vapory florets. Yes, you talk about that point and maybe the reason, the, the main reason which for one, Which one? Can you, can you repeat? Papery, papery, papery floret. Papery floret, okay. Yes, uh, if it's possible, I can share uh, my screen. I will show you one photo. If it's Later, possible. maybe that you can send to me the, by email because okay. otherwise okay. people, uh, yeah, people are on this one, but uh, you can send to my email and then we can okay. chat on that. Okay. So anything about the water management? No, about water management, no, already it's a good um, presentation from Dr. Uh, from Malaysia, from Dr. Muhammad. But I just want uh, more details about this paper florets because it's already appeared in the salinity, uh, salinity stress area in rice. Yes. But what if you find it in your field without any stress? Is this only the reason is the stress to see this phenomena in the field? Or is there any other reason according to what happened during the cell division? And this mismatching may be cause this phenomena or not? Because yeah, this I is, already that. Yeah, this you can send to me by email and I can explain you everything on that one. Yes, we can find this papery florid, particularly when the stress is at the booting stage. So it takes a little bit time when the booting stage is there and then they accumulate the salt in the paper, like a florid and that florid right. becomes like a sterile and that way it is there. But I can explain more when you will send to the, send the email to me. I can explain and even we can chat on that one. Okay, I will send it to you because we found it in no no doubt, no salinity. Your voice is feeble, your voice is splitting. Okay, yes, I will send it to your point. We can't hear you now. What? Okay, so maybe you can send email to me and then we can just discuss on that. So any other query, otherwise, otherwise we can sum up this thing. For me, thank you. So, okay. Thank you very much. So it was a very nice particular session, two hour session. And uh, it covered most of the important topics on the recent, like a, recent technologies and developments on the concept of the rice production in salt affected areas, including the water management and the, the concept, holistic concept on that one. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the DG Iqba and DG Mardi, Dr. Tarifa from here, for their proactive role to organize this webinar and they just encourage the more collaborations always and this is one of the like you know example of that one and the special gratitude to dr sharwal taraf chief operation and development ikba and dr mohammad saifuddin abdul rahman director rice research rice and paddy research in mardi for giving the complete global perspective on the rice importance their particular the extent of that one and how we can utilize this knowledge, the collaboration knowledge, particularly to enrich the knowledge of the staff, which is more needed at the moment. And collaboration is one of the one of the key key aspect in case if we have to go ahead together. Then they also mentioned about the sustainable water use and also gene structure, particularly in marker assisted selection. So this is very good, and we can we can enhance this collaboration later on. And uh, we can just go hand in hand with you, particularly, or uh, this one will be a starting point, not the end point. It is a starting point. So thank you very much for both of you. That excellent welcome remark, as well as the holistic view of the rice research in the uh, salinity tolerance. The, I would like to extend thanks to the, all the speakers, Dr. Khalil Ammar, 
Mrs. Reniza Binti Kumar 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 Zuman and Mr. Muhammad Hanif Ahmed. So they had a very rich presentation, and I think the people have their email also. And in that email, you can directly contact them and communicate with them on some like you know issues. In case if you feel that this is more relevant to your research, you can always communicate with them. We are just email away. And in the last but not the least, I would like to extend a special thanks to Mr. Mutalib, Head Knowledge Management and Communication, Ikwa. And also Liana, his her name is full name is Nor Liana Binti Yusuf from Mardi. Thank you very much. But before that, can I ask one thing that if you can in like uh, put the video on yeah. so that we can take the is, is screenshot? Yeah, cute. we can have all the people please switch on the camera. I would like to invite all of you a uh, group photo session. Still, some people, yes, if you can open the screen. Okay, everyone, if ready, I shall count. Yes, you can also take, and I can also take, so that let's see which one is better. Dr. Khalil Ammar. Okay, Miss, Mr. Pawan Kumar, Miss Nadia. Dr. Khalil, yes, please. Okay, ready, Thank everyone? You. Say, I, one, two, three, say cheese. <laughs> okay, one more time. Do you one, see my picture? Two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you and very much. Thank you. Over to Liana in case if you have any announcement, particularly after the seminar. But from my side, I thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to become like a master of ceremony on this one, or rather, um, uh, go through the cruise through this whole seminar and webinar. So over to you, Liana. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakesh. So um, on behalf of uh, the organizing committee, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. So till, till we meet again next time and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You have a good day. Uh, thank you.